Hello friends, welcome to Be Waste Wise. Uh, I am Shweta Dandapani. I am the community builder at Be Waste Wise. And uh, today we have a very exciting panel, our first webinar that discusses waste management issues in the Caribbean. So uh, we have Shan Young, who's a waste management educator, consultant, and social entrepreneur. She's the moderator for today's webinar. And thanks a lot, Sean, for putting this webinar together. Like I did mention, this is the very first time we're talking uh, about managing waste in the Caribbean islands. And uh, Sean is going to talk to three others from who hail from different islands within the Caribbean. There's Terry Lafon, who's a recycling and recovery manager at Trinidad, Trinidad and Tobago Solid Waste Management Company Limited. There's uh, Shelly Ann Dunkley, who uh, from Live Eco. And there is Nerlin Valentine, who is an educator and green engineering and communication studies lecturer. Uh, thanks for the overwhelming response with the registration as well as the questions that you have sent in. We've sent the questions to, to the panelists and uh, Sean is gonna ensure that your questions are incorporated in the questions that she's gonna post to the panelists as well. We hope to answer as many of those as we can today. However, the Q&A section is open do share your questions uh, because as and when it seems relevant to the conversation, Sean will pick them up and post them to the panelists. And if your questions aren't answered in the panel, we'll ensure that they get answered when the uh, webinar goes up on our website. So over to you, Sean, that's about it from my end. Thank you very much, Sita, and welcome to everyone for joining us on our panel today. I am very, very excited to have you all on as we discuss managing waste in the Caribbean. As Sita said, I really advocated for this panel today because I really wanted to shed some light on how we as island states manage our waste. So um, just to begin, and to give a little bit of a background um, for those of you who may not be familiar, we all live on island states and um, for, for us, managing waste comes with its own intricacies. I'm not as young anymore, so I did write things down. If you see me looking down, it's because I'm reading. Okay. <laughs> so throughout this, the Caribbean region, um, solid waste management has not really been receiving the attention it rightfully deserves. And this is Shan's opinion, right? And I think my, my sister colleagues would tend to agree. Um, although its relevance to the economic and environmental spheres can be clearly perceived, oftentimes solid waste has to compete with other pressing issues that we have facing our islands, such as crime, uh, fiscal and trade matters, financial matters, poverty, unemployment, education, and health, especially now that we are in a pandemic. You know, health is at the top of the list. Um, so we definitely uh, need to be placing more attention on waste. For us, climate change is very much an issue. Although we are some of collectively, we are the smallest contributors to greenhouse gas emissions. We tend to feel the brunt of the effects because of our warm Caribbean waters. Therefore, we have seen an increase in weather and changes in our weather patterns in terms of climatic events like hurricanes, floods, we've had some extreme flooding events that we have not seen in years. When I asked my grandmother, who's 90, she said she has not seen flooding um, within these last three years that she's seen her entire life. So we really are faced with um, you know, a number of challenges. One of the other things that we also have as island states that some of our road systems are very narrow, hard to reach. So oftentimes waste collection is a problem in those areas. Um, one of the solutions that we have seen is a communal bin system um, where we have one main bin for an entire community, but then we have the issue of regular collection. We have the issue of pests and so on. Um, attacking the waste. For most of us, landfilling is our main method of disposal. We have recycling initiatives. Um, however, in Trinidad and Tobago, especially recycling is not mandatory, it's voluntary. So we have a number of, of systems and policies that, are, that need to be in place um, and that are still happening at varying levels um, of the 
country and how we operate as island states. So government, we have a lot of a number of policies. Um, there was recently a plastic waste conference held in Jamaica that Shelly and I and Terry um, participated in as well. So we have a number of initiatives that are coming on board where waste is concerned in the Caribbean because we recognize that we really have to do more to manage our waste effectively and efficiently. So maybe enough of my talking, let's delve right into the questions, ladies. So the first question I will ask you, and ready to, to give our listeners um, you know, a good idea of where we are in terms of our varying countries, because we have Trinidad and Tobago, we have Jamaica, and we have St. Vincent and the Grenadines represented. Um, I want to ask you, for each of your islands, what has what have you seen in terms of the changes in waste figures? Let's say if we were just to compare last year, 2020 to 2019, because I realize we're in a new year now, right? Um, just to give some idea of, of where we are. So uh, Shelly, would you like to go first? Sure, sure. Morning, <laughs> afternoon, good evening <laughs> to our watchers. Um, well, I actually had to reach out to our national authority, which is our national solid waste management um, authority for some of these numbers. And what I saw was there was actually an increase in the volumes that were collected in 2020 over 2019. So to me, that was quite significant. I mean, most people are home, so you know they're able now to collect um, their trash regularly. Um, so 2020, I, I don't know, for me, it was quite interesting. You know, it was over, I'd say 920,000 tons in 2020 compared to 871,000 tons in 2019. So to me, that was quite significant. However, when you compare the numbers for plastics and recycling, um, that, there was actually a decrease in that. I mean, you had schools closing, a lot of people actually just threw their, their plastics in the regular trash because you know there was lockdown, various areas were actually locked down. So you had the national lockdown and then you had you know, different um, areas in themselves that were locked down separately. So there was a decrease in plastic being recovered um, but in terms of what you were saying Sean you know a lot of what we see here is because of the pandemic you know you do see a lot of changes in terms of um, just people's movement in general you know you're not able to go and collect or drop off the way they would want to because of the lockdown or even the fear of just going out and doing basic things that you would normally do so it's it's quite interesting to see waste overall there was an increase um, however, in terms of recyclables, that actually decreased significantly. And I'll give you some numbers. 2019, there was up to, I would say, 84 million bottles that were collected or recovered. That's 2019. And in 2020, you have 72 million bottles that were collected. So it's quite interesting to see that difference. Um, I do believe the bulk of this in terms of recycling, when I was with Wisconsin Group Limited, the bulk of the plastics that I saw coming in was from the schools, you know, because we had schools competitions, you're trying to get the, the students recycling from early, but because school was closed for most of the year, you know, there, where, where were people to drop off their plastics? So. Good. Yes, and thank you so much, Shelly. And I've, I've seen that as well, um, because even for me, I'm like, okay, the nearest place for me to drop off, and this is just as a consumer I'm talking here, the nearest place for me to drop off my bottle closes. So if I don't go within their opening hours, I miss that window. And exactly. that in itself poses some level of difficulty for people to, to deposit their recyclables. So that, yeah. you know, so that is something that we definitely have to look at in the future. Thank you so much, Shelly. Terry? Okay, morning everyone. Um, well, morning from sunny Trinidad and Tobago. Um, I know it's night for some of our panelists. I know um, we have different time zones tuning in. So thank you for taking your time out to listen to us. Um, so in terms of uh, our 
statistics. Our statistics are quite similar to Jamaica. We saw a lot of increases in the amount of waste going to the landfills. So overall, we had um, a 20% increase um, of waste from 2019 to 2020, whereas the same period, like 2018 to 2019, there was a 5% increase. So there was a 15% increase year on year uh, for the amount of waste entering the landfills. And for our recycling operations, we also saw a decrease. Now, the decrease was simply from the processing side. Um, the processing side, we saw a 34.3% decrease uh, from 2019 to 2020. And again, that was COVID impacts. We had to close recycling facilities. We had to um, look at our guidelines in terms of the World Health Organization would have put our guidelines in terms of managing waste. Um, during the pandemic. So we had to step back a little bit and um, allow our waste some time to settle before we could deal with it. Some of it we had to divert. So um, we had a 34.3% decrease in processing of recyclables during the COVID period. But for landfill operations, you had an overall 20% increase of waste going in. Now, our biggest increase was at, um, at one of our smallest sites, which is Gonapo. Shan, you would know the Gonapo site. Now, mm -hmm. we had a we have three sites that we manage at Sumkal. We have the Beetham site, which is in our Port of Spain area. We have the Forest Park site, which is one of our central areas. And then we have the Gunapo site, which is located east of Trinidad. And we had in 2019 to 2020, 53.1% increase in the amount of waste going to Gunapo. Um, and I will explain why that is a problem. Uh, Guanapo is one of our small is our smallest site in terms of land space and land size, and we are actively looking at managing the the waste because we 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 are almost out of space initially essentially, and if we are not careful with managing the waste, we will have to bring up closure plans. Um, we'll have to bring up closure plans um, and close much sooner than we intend to. But um, a 53.1% increase in waste going to a small site is quite alarming to me, All right? Um, we had a 10.6% increase at Forest Park, which is one of our biggest sites, and uh, uh, which is one of our bigger sites. It's a mid-sized site. And then we had a 17.3% increase at Ethan, all right? So those are the three sites that we manage, and those are the kinds of waste that we had to, um, those are the differences that we saw uh, between 2018, 2019, 2020. That is very, very interesting, Terry, because I am, um, two things came up um, when you were speaking. One, of course, is the fact that the smallest site is collecting more waste. Um, and another thing for those who are listening, um, where that landfill is, there are also some rivers that are nearby. Um, so an increased collection, you know, is something that, of course, Terry and the rest of her colleagues at Swim Call are definitely paying attention to because it can have serious ramifications in the long term. Um, but the fact as well to question to you as well, Terry, based on what you said in terms of the reduction of rates um, of the collection of recyclables, is that because the facility had to close because of the lockdown, you think? Uh, it partly is due to the okay. lockdown. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's not necessarily the incoming that was redu reduced, but the processing oh, of it, yes, ah. uh, we had a period um, just when the country went into lockdown. We were closed for probably about about three weeks, so we had to send staff home. You know, we could not accept we could not accept anything. We had to minimalize acceptance. We had to centralize acceptance to one site. Remember, we operate at three sites. 
So mm -hmm. we really had to curtail our operations significantly to make sure that one, our employees were safe, and two, that we followed the um, international health guidelines in terms of management of our waste and our recyclables at that time. Okay, okay, understood. And Shelly, I remember you and I having a conversation and saying that some of the recyclers, like recycling partners of Jamaica also had to close with the lockdown, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, they so that, yeah. yeah, so that is something that would have um, affected their ability as well too, to process to process materials as Terry was saying. Um, yeah, so that they were, yeah, they were actually, actually hit twice. They were actually hit twice with lockdowns mm -hmm. because with the national lockdown, you know, the entire country is, is down. But then um, the area in which their headquarters is based is St. Catherine. And then St. Catherine had its own lockdown separate and apart from, you know, everyone else. So they were hit twice with that. Um, it's quite unfortunate, but at the same time, I, I believe given the, the time, the time frame in which they were able to get back in operation, you know, we're we're able to see that people want to recycle because the numbers, the numbers are, are significant in terms of the difference. However, there's still collection, you know, it's not like the, the thing entirely stopped. So while yeah. there is that huge difference, you do see the fact that people still want to recycle. And I, I believe that there's been an increase in that as well since. Okay, great. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Makes sense. Nolene, your turn. <laughs> what has what have you what have you seen in terms of the changes in, in data for St. Vincent and the Grenadines? And Nolene, I would also like you. To just give a bit of a background, I would say just to preempt her that um, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, so the Grenadines are many smaller islands, St. Vincent is mainland. Um, so even with that as well comes, you know, some, you know, some challenges when it comes to managing waste on those smaller islands, whether it has to come to mainland St. Vincent, um, if they have to handle their own things via barges in between, you know, so all of those things, uh, because we have many other islands in Bahamas, as many small islands, Jamaica is one large island, Trinidad and Tobago are two separate, two separate islands, one country. Um, mm -hmm. So now Tobago also is looking at its own handling of some of its own waste, because for many, many, many years, waste from Tobago had to come to Trinidad to be processed. Right, so Nolene? <laughs> First, let me say hello to everyone um, who's joining us today. And thank you, Sean, for inviting me to be a part of this very important discussion. Um, as you said, St. Vincent has a very you know, intricate situation because we are an archipelago of islands, 32 islands and keys, but um, only Three of those islands are, you know, really inhabited. There are very, there are some private islands. So today the statistics will be given from the main island and those smaller islands. Um, the Central Water and Sewage Authority, which is the organization in charge of um, waste, specifically the Solid Waste Management Unit at that organization, is in charge of. Um, collection and disposal of waste on the main island and the, the Grenadine Islands. Um, in St. Vincent, we have um, about five landfills. We have two on the main island. We have Diamond, which is situated on the windward side of the island. And we have Belisle, which is situated on the leeward side of the island. The three islands, Bekwe, Kanawan, and Yunnan Island, those are the Grenadine Islands where, you know, it mostly tourists um, um, go there and enjoy the sun, sea, sand, because they have white sand. The main island has black sand, so they are tourist islands, yes. Um, what the statistics show is that um, there's been an increase in all of the years um, on the diamond landfill and the, the data, um, the, 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 the data in terms of volumes, right? And I must say thank you to Zinzi Robinson. She's another woman in sustainability issues. She works at the Central Water and Sewage Authority, the Solid Waste Management Unit. And I wanna thank her for providing me with the figures that I will give you. 
Okay, in 2019, the diamond landfill had 167,000, sorry, 366 per metric cubic, um, cubic meter um, garbage. In 2020, they collected 179, 365. So there's an increase. Um, in Belisle, um, there's an increase about 2,000 more. They had 17,000 in 2019 and 20. Um, no, sorry, there's a reduction, sorry, in Belisle. Um, that's 17,605, and in 2020, we have 15,000. So overall, in 2019, um, especially in the Caribbean, in, in, given a total figure, we have 215,817. And in 2020, we have 2,224,532. Oh in total. So there's been an increase in um, garbage. Um, what I must say is that in our landfills, we compress and compact our garbage and cover them. They're covered. They're not just thrown and left out there. And um, visitation to the main landfill, which is the diamond landfill on the island, there is no smell, which is very good because they're buried. Um, as it relates to recyclables, the, the waste management unit do not collect recyclables. A private company called All Island Recyc um, Recycling Incorporated, um, which was established in 2013, collects um, recyclables. And what they do, they offer an incentive to customers. So let me just give you some figures as to why people have been um, so concerned and so interested in recycling um, plastic bottles, um, cans, um, and paper. So they offer a rate of $2.75 per kilogram for the sorted clear containers and 50 cents for unsorted containers. The HDPE is offered at 10 cents per kilogram. And with this incentive, there has been a significant reduction of plastic bottles and um, in the waste streams and litter on the streets. So um, they also partner with schools um, and the waste management unit to provide bins and so on. So besides offering that incentive, they have invested in the reduction of plastics on the island. So we must commend this organization, which is one of the main organizations that do this. So, so far, um, in terms of the collection of plastics, um, as of 2020, October 2020, there have been some 894 tons of 42 million units. Um, and PET, there has been some 180 tons of HDPE containers that have been removed from the environment, which is, a, which is very commendable. Um, I would say that there's been an increase overall in 2020 in the garbage disposals as, as we all identified because of the pandemic, people have been generating more waste. So there have been an increase um, where that is concerned. Thank you very much, Nalene. And I'm, I'm happy that so much has been going on um, in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Two things coming out of what you said. And ladies, I want you to feel free if there's anything that you want to add based on a particular question that I have asked, that you go ahead and just um, unmute yourselves and, and add to the question, right? Because, and another thing that I would comment on is that we have been getting a number of questions in the q and I am going to really try, as we say, my endeavor best to answer all of the questions. Um, but one of the things that came out, you Nolina, know, of what you said, and it's the same in Trinidad and Tobago, and it's the same in Jamaica, is that we have varying institutions who handle waste at different levels. So where Terry sits at the Trinidad and Tobago Solid Waste Management Company, their responsibility is to manage the land, the three landfill sites, and they also have a material recovery facility, which is the largest in the Eastern Caribbean Terry, if I if I'm, you can also correct me if I'm wrong, right? One of the largest material recovery facilities in the Eastern Caribbean as well. 
um, in Jamaica, you have the National Solid Waste, the NSWMA, right? Um, right, Shelly? Then you have NEPA, um, but you also have private organizations like Recycling Partners of Jamaica as well, um, who also work together with the state to manage. And just like you were mentioning, um, Nolene, there's the other organization who um, really takes the, the, the reins and the, and the lead when it comes to um, managing the collection of the recyclables specifically. Um, and it's excellent that you guys are using methods for the sanitary engineer title also say that as well to the attendees that for a number of us, we don't have sanitary engineer sites. Um, so it, be, it is difficult. I know Swim Call is planning to convert one of the sites to an engineer site as well. Um, because we do understand that um, that is the direction that is the international best practice. But as Terry also mentioned in her conversation, we, we're island states, we only have so much room <laughs> to continue to get bigger and bigger and bigger without compromising land space available for agriculture, land space available for housing and so on. So it's a very delicate issue that has to be managed because we also have the NIMBY syndrome, not in my backyard. Nobody wants to know that a landfill is literally right out their windows, um, but it's something if we don't really handle the waste well, we would be faced in a number of difficulties. So ladies, yes. one of the questions um, that I saw in the Q&A is about food waste, right? Um, I would say as a, a precursor that for all of us, Number of, a number of studies has been done that the majority of our waste is organic. That still holds true, although we have our plastics kind of challenging the organics um, these days, it still holds true. So um, for me, and I would say based on my experience, um, the, we have some initiatives that are coming on board, like I teach people how to start composting at home. Um, there may be, uh, I don't know, is there a composting facility in, um, in Jamaica, Shelly? Is there one that exists? Merlin, do you know of any that exists um, in St. Vincent as well? Go ahead. I believe private sector, more private sector um, has okay. been dealing with that. There were some, there was some years ago that NSWMA, they did have a composting program um, and they actually ended up selling selling the the soil in the end um right. so but i'm not sure what exactly happened with that project after all um but i do believe that there are lots of private sector companies that have taken on that okay. opportunity okay. i do know of uh, richmond vale academy they are a private owned um, entity and they encourage composting, they teach composting um, and especially where farmers are concerned, they teach them to compost and to use um, biogas as, um, as an alternative um, to, the, to using the slurry to help their farms and, and so on. But in terms of an organization or um, that does that, no but more private and we do it at the homes. And one of the projects that I have implemented at the college with the backyard garden is to use the waste um, to use as manure for the plants. So people will do that on a private basis and farmers, people have been doing that for years, but in terms of um, a st um, state owned organization, no. Terry, any thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, we do have, uh, um, again, everything that is being done is being done privately, private sector. Um, we do, I do know of a couple individuals who have purchased um, composters, yeah, and um, it kind of like industrial grade composters, and they have been using it like, um, particularly for restaurant waste, et cetera. So they would go into the restaurant to get the food scraps, um, get the, um, the vegetable scraps, not necessarily the food scraps, but the vegetable scraps. And they would use that as feedstock for their composters. Um, but in terms of a state-sponsored composting 
uh, drive? No, I know at Swim Call we did have a composting project some years ago. That was probably back in the 90s. Um, <laughs> but to say we have anything currently, no. That's, it's really, really private sector right now. Right. Um, so, Sean, I, I yeah, must add um, that, um, that the, the Solid Waste Management Unit, they um, produce compost at the site from the green chipping, the green grass, fresh green grass that comes to the landfill. And um, so they use it you know, as green waste in order to reduce and to divert waste from the landfill. Um, but other private institutions do take on that responsibility um, on their own. Okay, and I have I've actually seen that as well, um, that it is really private sector driven. Um, and as such, we don't really have any data yet to support it other than the last waste character. Well, this is for Trinidad and Tobago, the last waste characterization study that was done where we saw that over 26 roughly percent of our waste um, was organic. And so that, so therefore we know and now we're overdue <laughs> for another study to be done. Um, but because it's private sector driven, we don't really have um, a lot of data yet coming in uh, um, other than that study that was done nationally. Um, I also know just to add a little bit of another country, um, which is at Barbados. Barbados has the SBRC, which is the Sustainable Barbados Cycling Center, I believe. Um, and they actually have a full, a very large um, facility where organic waste does come in and gets processed turned into compost that people can buy by the bag, right? They can buy mulch um, as well too. I think it's $5 Bayesian. I don't know how much US dollars that is. <laughs> but it's really, really cheap. That much I do know. Um, so we, again, but that was also too led by the private sector. So we realize where this is concerned. Um, they really have been taking the lead, but we also see the benefit of private and public partnerships and how that could really um, take us even further forward. So let me um, ask another question. Um, I'm just going through. Other questions here. Um, because of COVID, um, and Terry, I would ask you this one. Because of COVID, have you seen, um, have we been really been able to quantify, you think, yet? Or maybe there is the intent to do so. Um, the waste that is medical, that is coming in as a result of, of COVID, do you think that has... Is there an intent to do so? Because I know right now it may be a bit difficult, um, but do you think that there may be an intent to, to look at um, the waste coming in, this medical waste, especially the gloves, the masks, and so on that is coming in? Has the Ministry of Health been able to provide any data to support that yet? Um, that's, that's a really interesting question. Um, we have, we at the landfills, we do not receive any type of medical waste, right? right. So right. therefore, even with COVID, with COVID particularly, um, all that waste would be categorized as infectious medical waste, which is supposed to go straight to the um, the hospitals, incinerators, with incineration facilities, because each hospital is a major hospital is supposed to have an incineration facility. So. I can't say we don't get those statistics from the hospitals. Um, and I don't know if we can reach out to the Ministry of Health and ask them for that. But um, they are really the ones to, to provide that kind of information in terms of the type of waste coming out. But with COVID particularly, everything is supposed to go to the incinerators now. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. And one of the things that I also have been doing is I know that we have home quarantining happening now because, you know, the state was put under a lot of pressure um, for quarantining. So now we have the option of quarantining at home. And one of the things that we try to encourage as well is for people to separate um, their, the waste that comes with taking care, especially if, it's, if somebody is who has the virus and cannot get to the hospital or their symptoms are, are much, much less severe, 
Um, and the, the ministry has advised that they can, in addition to um, with the county medical office of health, um, that they can take care of themselves at home to separate that waste from their regular domestic waste um, and leave it for 72 hours before they put it out. Because for us, our sanitation workers are not the best equipped in terms of personal protective equipment. We will just say that. Um, so we also have to protect our workers as well. Um, question for Nolene. Um, this is about e-waste. And ladies, feel free to chime in if you have any other two cents that you would like to add with e-waste. Is there, um, what have you seen in terms of how e-waste is managed? What do you know of? Is there anybody who's collecting the electronic waste separately in, the, in St. Vincent and Shelley and Terry all could add what is happening in Jamaica and, and Trinidad after Nolene? Nolene? Um, to be honest, I'm not really sure about e-waste and how it is collected, but I do know that um, a lot of people like private institutions, people who own phone shops and so on, they recycle those, those waste, use them for other um, uses. But in terms of um, the collection of e-waste as um, separately from the total disposals that they, they collect at the solid waste management, I'm not sure if um, to answer that person's question, I'm not sure I'll have to get more data on that. Okay. Um, I, you, yeah. Go ahead. I will say, um, all right, there was one entity that I learned about just last year and the name saves me right now, senior moment. Um, but they, that, that entity actually collects more from companies, which I find quite surprising because um, there's, there's such a wide span of the entire population, but their focus is really just on corporate. You know, let's collect your, your hard drive, your mainframes, et cetera, et cetera. But then, you know, what do I do with my laptop that isn't working anymore or my cell phone? Like I literally have um, a Blackberry from 1990 something <laughs> in my home. And I'm like, what do I do with it? So it's just sitting here. Um, and then I know that some of the, the telecoms, um, they were actually collecting a few years ago, but I haven't heard anything about that as well. And um, I believe National Solid Waste Management Agencies also authorities actually coming up with a program. I spoke with them last year um, when that very same question came to me. And I was just like, what do we really do? Because you know, you've heard about things happening and then I, I think it's, you know, they, they do their public awareness and their PR and their marketing behind the initiative and then people start dropping off and after a while people just kind of forget about it because there's no more marketing and PR, you know, so then it just fizzles away. But um, it's something that we really need to look into, especially now, you know, a lot of schools are now getting laptops and tablets and computers what is then going to become of all this technology, you know, once it's obsolete? Because these things aren't made to last forever. We know this. So we need th something in place to be able to manage this. Everybody's getting tablets donated, you know, 2020 into 2021. A lot more technology, e-waste is coming into play. And that's something that we really need to shift and look into. There are definitely opportunities there. Um, Sean, um, just to mention, yeah, go ahead. Sure, yes. Just to mention, the solid waste management does collect white goods. Um, and so people may, may throw in their um, maybe old computer and so on, but that is done twice yearly. But in terms of the question I was asked, in terms of what they do with it after, I am not sure, but I know that they collect white goods yearly, um, twice a year, sorry, um, apart from the regular waste. So, but in terms of what is done with it, um, I'm not sure. And as mentioned, um, some of the mobile companies, they will have a, maybe a special and they ask you to bring in your old tele, um, com mobile. And basically that's it, yeah. So in terms of what is done with the waste after, I'm not sure, but I do know that the, the solid waste management collect um, white goods twice um, a year. Twice a year, and maybe the, the computer stuff will fall into that category for them. Yeah, maybe, yeah, people will throw in their old computers and so on. And that. But in terms of collection of e-waste, 
um, as a separate waste? No. Okay. Sorry. Sure. Yeah. Um, okay. So, with from Trinidad's perspective, um, we do have um, we do have some management of e waste. Uh, we do not allow e-waste to come into the landfills. Uh, however, if persons include, if they throw an old cell phone into their regular municipal solid waste, we will not pick it up, right? Mm -hmm. So there are instances of it probably getting in and we would not be able to know because we are not going to pick apart municipal solid waste, to, solid waste. To, get, to get to that one cell phone. One We're not board. going to do that. Right. right? Yeah. So um, there are, again, um, private sector companies that have been doing this for some time. Um, mm -hmm. There are three of them that I know of. Um, there's Piranha International, there is Caribbean Tech Disposals, and there's another one called Recyclage E-Waste Management. Now, um, those uh, companies, again, private sector companies, they collect the um, the e-waste at a cost. They separate the components and they ship them for recycling purposes, right? Oh. So those companies do that. Now from a national perspective, from Swim Calls perspective, um, we do have our policy and planning unit. Um, they were established quite recently and they are working on some of the harder to treat with waste, especially for island states. So we have our policy unit developing national policies. It's in the pipeline right now. Um, national policies for things such as e-waste, such as tires, and those things are going to become um, national policies in terms of how the country is going to treat with those particular types of waste. So those things are in the pipeline and are being developed currently. And that is that is excellent because someone also asked the question about um, integration of islands in terms of managing waste. I would say that there's we have the Caribbean Community of Islands or CARICOM for short, um, where as a group, all of our prime ministers meet regularly. I don't know how often they meet, but I know they meet regularly um, to talk about issues facing us all as CARICOM member states. And, um, you know, it is, you know, waste is one of those things that um, people uh, who, such as Terry and her colleagues at Swim Call and the heads of the companies kind of advocate for. Um, it may be difficult to have everybody across the board having the same stance because we all operate differently. We all have different resources that are available to us. Um, and as such, that would affect our ability to, to do the same things across the board. Is there the possibility that that, that could be done? Probably. Um, but it will have to be well thought out, well executed. So I really like what Terry just said in terms of there is um, talks and plans that are coming where looking at nationally those hard to recycle items or hard to process items, because as she rightfully said, you know, a lot of these things may be shipped out of our islands for processing. Uh, because we do not have the mechanisms to handle them here. We can separate, we can donate, we can do all of those things. Um, because as Shelley pointed out, a lot of children need devices. So I know some of them, you know, once you uh, put your, your device up, they may look to see if it could be refurbished. And if it can be refurbished, they'll donate it to schools, right? So those are some of the things that are happening. But I do not want... Um, because we are islands, there are a number of things that we are working on as island states. We don't have it all together. We are still, you know, trying to get things done. Um, but it will take some time because we do have other issues, as I said right in, in the very beginning, that tend to be a little higher on the gender. So it's always a balancing act when it comes to looking at our waste and managing it and seeing, okay, can we discuss this now? No, we'll have to wait, you know? So that is, those are some things that we definitely 
um, do face, notwithstanding some of our other brothers and sister islands, as we call them, that are really doing fantastic things. We all look at their models and see how best we can integrate them in our respective countries, right? Um, David Biderman asks about tourism and how, la how large a contributor is tourism to waste generation on your islands. Um, since tourism declined a lot due to COVID, wouldn't that mean less trash and recyclables? Um, I would start by saying to David that for Trinidad and Tobago, our economy is based on oil and gas still. Um, however, Jamaica has a very high uh, tourism market. Tobago, well, actually, let me say it differently. Um, Trinidad and Tobago as a unit or GDP is based on oil and gas or gross domestic product. However, so for Tobago specifically, their GDP is based highly on tourism. Um, Jamaica also has a high tourism factor, and I would assume the same for St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Oftentimes, Trinidad was the one looked at because they say we have oil and gas money, <laughs> right? But that sector was completely um, hit because of the virus as well, and has been not just for the virus, but oil prices have been steadily declining, going up, fluctuating, you know, so all of these things, and when we're putting our budgets together, we have to pay attention to. So ladies, I don't know if you want to add anything else in terms of tourism and waste, um, in terms of what you've seen or what you what you think may be possible, because we could, we could talk possibilities as well. We don't just have to, to talk about what currently exists, but we could talk about, you know, what are some of the things that we could also look at um, moving forward as well. So you guys have any input uh, when it comes to tourism and waste? Um, well, I don't have the numbers on how that has been affected, the waste um, collection there. I have seen a shift, however, with a lot of the hotels where they're actually moving away from plastic bottles. So you're, you're actually now getting a reusable bottle when you, when you come on um, or when you, you go to the hotels. So there's that shift as well as they have refill stations, you know, at the hotels. So there is that shift there. There is also, you know, partnerships in play where whatever plastics they do have, they're actually being recycled and collected. So again, I don't have all the numbers. That's something that I can work on. And I guess um, David, I believe is, is the name. If you can reach out to um, Wastewise and we can definitely get that, that number to you. Anybody else wants to add anything? Um, for, well, um, as it relates to St. Vincent, the Grenadine Islands are the ones that, you know, where the tourists um, congregate. Um, I would say that a lot of educational awareness has been going on in the Grenadines. As, as speaking particularly um, from Union Island, um, that's the last Grenadine Island. They have um, this um, organization, um, non-profit organization called SUSGREN and Grenadine Attackers. And they and other organizations have been um, really pushing hard about, you know, sustainability, keeping the island clean. And so when tourists come, they, they are faced with those messages. So they know it's not about, you know, littering. Um, they use um, a lot of um, natural drinking, like coconut shells and stuff like that, that would discourage, you know, um, plastic bottles and so on. And even when those are used, you know, bins and so on are around to ensure that they are properly discarded and uh, collected. All right, I just want to make one contribution. Um, I think I think David's question also asked about um, if the, if there was an in, why wasn't there a, a decrease and um, in terms of the waste, right? Um, so I, I'm going to tackle it from a slightly different perspective. Our borders have been closed uh, uh, for almost a year now. Um, March would make it a year that our borders have been closed and uh, our schools have been shut down for almost a year. So we've had parents working from home, we've had kids working from home, um, we've had an increase of persons 
cleaning, cleaning their homes and cleaning on a more regular basis to avoid COVID. You've had an increase of um, children being home and eating. I don't know about all the other panelists, but during COVID, unfortunately, I gained some weight because I have been home. <laughs> I have been feeding my kids constantly. <laughs> I have been feeding my kids. <laughs> yeah, so I have been feeding my kids. Um, and to me, when I speak to other parents, because I'm a parent as well, when I speak to other parents, it's similar. Um, they're saying, you know what? I have been going to the grocery some sometimes twice, three times for the month because. Um, everybody's home, everybody's eating. So as everybody's eating, everybody's home, we're going to have that um, matching increase in the amount of waste generated. So it's not that um, because the tourists are not there, the waste type has changed. So we, we do have that waste type change resulting in the waste increase. Okay, and that is, that, that is, an excellent point because I think for a lot of us, we may not be necessarily, we may be focusing on quantities rather than seeing if the types have changed as well. Um, and that is extremely important. You raise up the point. I'm also a parent, you know, and I'm cooking um, I'm religiously. <laughs> I mean, like, why are these children eating so much? I, I, I don't understand. So for us, um, we definitely have more organic waste coming out too because you know we're eating more fruit we're cooking more food so it is you've seen that increase as well so we also have to i'm glad that you made that point Terry, that the waste type is also shifting as well so we have to pay attention to that but nerlene made a very very good point just now when she was talking about education and you all know these ladies know me i am extremely passionate about educating and education of the public. So this question is, and it may be a bit of a two-in-one question, ladies, so forgive me. Um, Nerlene talked about the fact there's a lot more education happening with uh, people in terms of how they manage their waste, what they need to do with it, where do they go and drop it off, and especially when it pertains to the recyclables, plastics, glass, tetra packs, cans, and so on. Um, question part A is what have you, uh, Shelly, to Shelly and Terry, and Nolene, if you want to add a little more, you can. What have you guys seen in terms of education? Um, and, it's, and in terms of education of the citizens in Trinidad and in Jamaica, because I know Jamaica is doing a lot, I know Trinidad. I mean, one of my favorite things in, in Jamaica was Not Dutty Up Jamaica, which is a fantastic campaign about keeping Jamaica clean. Swim Call has done a lot of work as well um, with trying to continue and try, continually trying to educate the public on what they should be doing. But another part B to that is, um, I think Aldwin asked about separation. And a lot of um, I said in the beginning for Trinidad and Tobago that recycling is voluntary, it's not mandatory. So if you understand that you should recycle your items, you would. But we do not have any one law that says that you have to. So um, what have you seen? I know Jamaica is really trying to um, encourage a lot of source separation as well. And there have been some laws, Jamaica has banned single-use plastics, right, Shelly? Um, you know, we, we in Trinidad and Tobago, there was the, um, uh, we wanted to ban the importation of styrofoam products. We have the beverage container bill that is still being considered where um, Lillian mentioned that there is a cost um, in terms of the returning of the recyclables. Trinidad and Tobago has the beverage container bill that we're still looking at in order to attach a cost for the return of the recyclables as an incentive. So ladies, I know I've said a lot, um, but part A, education, what have you seen? Part B, in terms of um, any intent for source separation, um, you know, in the respective countries, 
what 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 is your take on that? What is your opinion where that is concerned as well? So, um, who wants to go first? Anybody? I, I, I'll, I'll go first. I'll go first. <laughs> Take one for the team. <laughs> All right. So in terms of the first part of the um the question, in terms of education, right? Now, Sean, as you will be aware, um Swim Call has had uh several education programs over the years starting with Chase Away Charlie in the 1980s. And Charlie was the symbol of rubbish. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that caught on very, that caught on real strong in the 80s. You know, till children, children who sing and chase Charlie away, you know, everybody hung on to this, Charlie being garbage, we need to chase Charlie away. And that program um, kind of, just went, died a natural death. <laughs> and then from there, other educational programs kicked in. So we've had, um, we've had our community programs, um, which is CYOP, our community outreach programs. So where we've gone into communities, educated them about waste management, proper methods of waste management. We have um, the schools, um, the school sessions where we go into the schools and we talk to the children, we talk to the kids about waste management. Um, I've been to a couple of those sessions. Those tend to be pretty fun. Um, mm -hmm. We have as well uh, our public sector recycling program. So Swim Call is a public sector organization. We go into other public sector organizations and educate them about, again, separation at source. Um, we educate them about, okay, what can be recycled, what versus, what versus what cannot be recycled. And we put a structured program in place um, to allow them to become uh, that say eco champions. So they collect their materials, um, swim call goes, we collect the recyclables from them, they weigh it, et cetera. You know, so that data feeds back into um, our, our information pool on recycling and recyclables. We also have um, our municipal curbside recycling program. Now, Curbside collection is something um, that Swim Call ideally would like to see in every municipality. Now we have 14 municipalities. We would like to see it in every municipality. We do not have curbside collection um, as a standard thing in Trinidad and Tobago. However, we have had um, pilot curbside projects in six of the regional corporations and we, that's where Swim Call works with the regional corporations and we, um, and we help them set up a program for a six month period where um, residents are taught, okay, this is recyclable, this is not, right? And they have one day where they put out their recyclables and the other days they put out their garbage. Their recyclables come to our, um, one of our recycling sites and those recyclables are then processed, right? Um, now, in terms of, I know that the EMA is also doing some education of the Trinidad and Tobago citizens via the iCare project. And they also have a robust educational program. I can't speak to the details on their education program, but I do know of it. Right, and then we have private uh, sector, private social enterprises like SIL <laughs> that does their own, <laughs> that does their own Not education. Go ahead, Terry. Go ahead. Not shameless. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, so they they do their own um, education and classes, etc. So we do have different structured programs in Trinidad targeting environmental education and education on waste management specifically. Now, in terms of the second part of the question, which is source separation, um, some of those programs 
the intent of those programs is to get people to separate at source because we do not want a situation where things are coming in and you have to separate materials mm -hmm. at the landfill sites. That is less than ideal in any situation. So therefore you want the programs that we, we have and the programs, um, yeah, the programs that we have, we utilize those, program, those programs, those educational um, times to kind of share the message that separation at source is ideal. So I hope I answered the, there was just two parts of the question, right, Chan? I hope I answered the two parts of the question there. Yes, you did, Terry. Yes, you did. Um, Shelly, I know you're itching to add your comment. Go ahead, Shelly. <laughs> yes, I physically was itching. <laughs> um, all right, so I, I wrote down a few points because um, I wanted to make sure that I, I bring most of the points I want to bring across. But in terms of educating, one of the things that, I, that I'm sure everyone here has noticed, social media has brought so much information to just, just the globe in general in terms of how we communicate and the information that we communicate. So talking about climate change, talking about waste management, you know, we're seeing images from something happening in India. And, you know, we look at it and we're just like, wait, but is that Jamaica? It could be Jamaica, you know? and so there's so much content out there. So what one of the things I've noticed is our youngsters or youth, they're so eager to make a change, make a difference. You know, so when, when I go and I talk at schools and, and I hear the kids asking all these questions and they're so excited about learning how to manage their environment better or just do better, you know, because this is their future. So education is key. We have to make sure that for children in anything that we're doing, it's not a two-year or a one-year campaign that we're running we need to look at five ten twenty years so as the kids grow we're right alongside them you know you're you're in primary school when you get to high school we're still there <laughs> you know when you get to college we're still there and we're making sure that you are recycling you are managing your waste you know in the manner that you need to you need to put your garbage in a bin so education is is key um, you mentioned Nodotti of Jamaica. Yes, Jamaica Environment Trust did an amazing job with that campaign. Um, we still, however, see trash on the, on the ground. You know, so what can we do? How, how do we get to people where it matters, where they're able to envision that, you know, me throwing this um, snack wrapper on the floor might impact me down the line because everyone will tell you, oh, I didn't throw it there. Somebody else did. You know, we all need to take responsibility for what happens in our community, in our homes, and in our country, because it's ultimately, it's a, it's a cycle. It's going to come back and affect us some way, somehow. So one of the things that I try to do to, with persons that I speak with is tell them about their impact. You know, you consuming a, a beverage in a plastic bottle, if you don't recycle it, this is what could happen. Oh, but miss, you know, I never do this, but somebody else you know might, may have. You know, so let's talk to each other about how we impact our environment. Um, so you have different campaigns. When I was working with Wisinko, the, the tagline was recycling plastic feels fantastic. You know, when I, when I speak those words, to me, it brings a level of pride. You know, I want to be a part of this that is making everybody feel fantastic. What is this? You know, let's just put your plastic in a bin. And yeah, it, to me, it brings me a thrill. I don't know. How come? But then you also have Bag It and Bin It, that is Nepal's campaign. You have Put Plastic in Its Place, Recycling Partners of Jamaica. So everyone has something that's happening out there in terms of educating the public, but it's really to ensure that it, there's longevity and sustainability to all of these campaigns that we're talking about. <clears throat> um, and Corporate Jamaica, get them involved as well. Another big thing for, for us as individuals is convenience. You know, where do you go and drop off your plastic? Not everybody knows. Some people don't even know that there's recycling happening, you know, and, and recycling partners started, I believe, maybe 2016, 2014, 2016. So there's still more that needs to get out in terms of just letting people know. Generally, where do you go and throw your plastics or even what do you do with your waste in general? You know, um, your second question in terms of separation at source. 
solid waste management agency, they also had um, quite a few pilot projects that they that they had in various areas, St. Catherine, Kingston, and St. Banjo, where they were different communities and they asked persons to put their plastics out. So this is another way of educating people what to recycle and we'll make it convenient for you. We'll come and pick up at your house. Um, so it's really for us as individuals to try and do what we need to do for the betterment of our society. First, just separate, you know, and, and if you, they're not coming to your home to collect, then where can you go? Find this information. Sometimes it's really there just in your face. And yes, there are lots of things that happen on a daily basis. You know, how, how do you put food on the table? Somebody might get ill and, you know, you have to deal with those things. But how does how you treat the environment impacts your health? Um, my last, last point is Recycling Partners will be bringing on board soon. I'm not sure due to COVID what the timeline on it exactly is, but in terms of the deposit refund, you know, everybody wants to get paid now. Now that we're talking about recycling and we spoke about being paid for it some time ago, everyone wants to get paid for the individual bottles. So that is coming on stream. I'm really excited to see what's going to happen there and the mechanics behind that. Um, but it's, it will be a way for us to get rid of a lot of the plastics that we're seeing. Um, the single use plastic ban that was also um, quite, I, I believe it was successful for the most part, you know, everybody's now walking with their reusable bags. Like it's nothing and like it's, you know, it's a new fad or something because it's really cool. Some people go in there when it first started, I saw people going in the supermarkets with suitcases, you know, I, they used to have to get, whatever they just walk up with everything in them hand like yeah but it, it's exciting times and i'm looking forward to a lot more okay um Nalene, go ahead jump right in as it relates to St. Vincent i must commend the government for the initiatives that they have been taking um St. Vincent is one of the first islands that really banned styrofoam um the use of styrofoam um in the island we also banned um, the use of plastic bags. Um, so now people are using recyclables. Um, just by the, the mere fact that they have started a sustainable unit um, as a, a ministry um, is, shows political will for you know, that turnaround in terms of ensuring that the public knows the seriousness where um, garbage and sustainability um, um, is related. Um, there are some private institutions like Massey who have been really pushing that drive where plastic bags are concerned. So now there is a total ban on plastic bags. Um, we one of the first islands to ban, to, uh, ban styrofoam products. Um, so now we use uh, biodegradable um, products for food and, and so on. Um, as an educator, that's one of my biggest <laughs> passion is to really educate our young people um, about sustainability issues. Hence the reason why those projects at the college were started. The young people are they're the next generation and it's very, very important that they um, understand and know their responsibility as it relates to waste. The Solid Waste Management Unit has also been doing their part. Um, um, the, it was mentioned about social media. They have been using social media, radio ads, newspaper, what have you to get people to know when the dates um, for garbage collection. Um, they also have a program um, for the removal of derelict vehicles on the side of the roads. People know well in advance um, that they need to get those removed and they have um, partnered with the, the, the police department to get those vehicles moved because they are aesthetic, you know, distraction. Also, um, based in terms of illnesses, you know, we have a, we, dengue, I know, has been a major problem. So those initiatives and educating the public about the remove, um, the collection of white goods, they do that well in advance to let people know, hey, put out your white goods and they, and they are collected for free. They don't have to pay, you know? So those things I think are really um, 
ed, um, helping to educate people. They're also going to schools. They have partnered with me on my project at the college. This is the solid waste management, which shows their seriousness where um, waste management is concerned. Um, I would say that policy regulation is one of the biggest um, determinant factors of people's attitude. You could, you, I, what I've seen personally is that you educate people, but one of the hardest things to change is people's attitude. Um, so as much as you educate, you have to be repetitive. You have to be you know, purposeful about it because you know sooner or later people's attitude will begin to change. May not change right away, but I think policy regulation and enforcement is what will make a change. And people know that they have to do it. And in, in most of these countries, people know they have to do it or they will be fined they, you know, if they mix their garbage. Just even if they educate the public about separating garbage, when people know that there's consequences to their behavior, then they change. Um, and I don't think we have to be so draconian with our methods, but um, I think um, it's important for enforcement and policy regulation as it, re as it relates to separation, because we know that attitudes are very, very hard to change. And I've seen it as an educator. You will put bins, recycle bins, and people still just throw things wherever they want to. But when they know that there's a consequence to their behavior, they do change, which is not the best effort, but I think that works. And that will bring, that is a very good point, ladies. So um, two minutes, because I, I've given Shelly back what she gave to me the last time. I was in, <laughs> I was in a meeting with her, right? So closing words um, before, from two ladies, before I give my closing words um, for this webinar this evening, well, morning, evening, wherever you are, right? So Shelly. Um, I'll, I'll give you your lesson. One minute. Go ahead. <laughs> that's that's a um, What I would say is don't leave everything up to the government. That's the first thing. We all have an individual role to play in managing our waste, um, taking care of our environment in general. So do what you can. If, if something is not working in your favor, um, then talk to your elected official. You know, talk to whatever entities are around. But I mean, everybody that's here, there, there is a, a, a level of awareness already. Everyone that is viewing, you know, us talking here. But at the same time, talk to your friends, talk to your family and make sure that persons are, you know, collecting or, or turning in their plastics. Don't wait for money to have to be exchanged, please, guys. It, it, it's our individual responsibility. And I, I don't know how else to say that, you know, it's heartfelt for me where, you know, persons need to get paid to recycle or need to get paid to drop off their, their waste properly. And it's just like, it's, it's not heartwarming, that's more heart-wrenching, <laughs> you know, but it's, it's our responsibility. So let's do what we need to do. Um, there, there are companies, private sector, there are lots of opportunities as well for entrepreneurs to come on board and turn our plastics into something. You know, plastic's not going to go anywhere for the immediate future. You know, it's, it's going to be here for a while. Um, there will be different versions of it. You, you now see our pets coming into play, that's that PET, plastic with recycled content. So you're going to have different um, ways that we're using our plastics. And don't think of plastic as just your single use bottle. You know, there are plastics all around us. You know, I'm staring at a fan blowing at me, keeping me nice and cool. There are plastic elements that make it you know, our computers, everything. So we now need to, I hate the phrase, you know, think outside the box or even pivot. Worse, don't tell me to pivot. Oh gosh. But as entrepreneurs, we need to find solutions. We need to find environmentally friendly solutions and people friendly solutions as well, because we want convenience. We want everything now. We also want that purchasing power or consumption and purchasing power has skyrocketed. Um, Right. So I'm saying a lot and I didn't realize that in a minute, but <laughs> there, there, there's our individual role that we need to play. And it's really for persons to do what they need to do in terms of managing your weight and taking responsibility for your actions. Thank you very much, Shelly. Terry, one minute. Eh? Don't do like Shelly now. 
you know, when we start, it's hard to stop us, right? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it's difficult to stop us. All right. So um, I'm, I'm going to say that apart from the individual responsibility, we also have a collective responsibility um, to ensure that our waste is managed in the correct manner. And like Shelley said, you can deal with it um, from the individual perspective in terms of individual responsibility, you ask the questions, right? But as a collective, we also have to stand up and say, enough is enough. We are small island states. We do not have any more room. Everybody has this not in my backyard principle. However, where are we going to put the waste when um, our current landfills are filled? What are we going to do with it then? So therefore, that's why I say we have a collective responsibility to say, okay, um, let me reduce my waste. Let me get my, let me ask questions to, to everybody that I can ask questions to. Um, let me lobby my, 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 my member of parliament. Because at the end of the day, if we do not do that, we will not have space to place waste. We yep. need to reduce. We need to, we do not have an option as island states. And that's my minute. <laughs> right, very good. Excellent, excellent. Thank you very much, Terry. Um, and I want to say this in closing, two, a few things. One lady, thank you so mm -hmm. very much for being a part of our first webinar on managing waste in the Caribbean. Clearly, people want to know a lot of what we do. So <laughs> I've already spoken to Sweeta for us to have um, many more sessions on managing waste in the Caribbean because there's still a lot more than we, that we can talk about. Um, there, are number, there were a number of questions about waste in the marine environment, especially sargassum seaweed and all of that. So we will have a second session focused on marine plastics, but we'll also have another one focused on land-based um, waste, which is what this session really focused on today. So ladies, I want to thank you very much to everybody who tuned in. I want to say a huge, huge thank you. I know that there is a lot. There's a gentleman was talking about fantastic work that is going on in St. Kitts and Nevis. And we acknowledge that there is wonderful work happening in our brother and sister island states. Um, and we all have to do our part to, to continue to do much better to manage waste. But, um, you know, I have the saying, and I'll, I'll close with that. We, if, and before Sweeter has to make her final comments. Um, and I also want to thank Free Waste Wise for giving us this opportunity and this platform to really talk about the issues that we are facing, that we are, that we are challenged with, but to also talk about the room for opportunity, because as you all said, there's a huge amount of space for people to come into the sector to make it really what it should be. Um, so, so I want to thank Sweeter and the Free Waste Wise team very much for allowing that. But I will say this in closing, and it's a quote that I live by. It is not always about doing things better, but sometimes we simply need to do better things. All right, so Suitha, over to you. Thank you so much, Sean. This was a very, very good discussion. Thanks a lot to all the panelists. I don't think I have to reiterate how the discussion was. I'm sure if you just look at chat, you'll realize how much people enjoyed the conversation. And uh, this is to all the attendees. We know that there are a lot of questions which have still gone unanswered. We will float the questions to the panelists, try to get the answers. And when this webinar goes up on our website, which is in two weeks time, hopefully we will have more answers for you then uh, than just today. Uh, just a reminder, we have another webinar happening next Friday and it's gonna be on food rescue. So please head to our website and you can sign up there. And hopefully with Sean moderating, we will have another webinar with her. We are looking at April and let's hope uh, we have panelists, based on panelists availability, we will list that as well on our website. Do sign up for our newsletter so that you get timely updates about it. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot to all of you and uh, to the panelists, please have a very good day. And uh, Nerlene, have a good night. <laughs> Bye -bye. Have a good night. <laughs> Bye.